Why be satisfied when you live in a world where people suffer through segregation, racism, and inequality? Why be satisfied when your children will be stripped of their freedom to go and be who they would like to be? Free of judgment, free of restraint, and free of external pressures and prejudices. In his famous I Have a Dream speech, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we are not satisfied and will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Are we satisfied today, I ask you? Is justice rolling down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream? I think that we all can agree that our society has made significant strides since Dr. King first moved the world with his powerful message. Yes, our society has made noteworthy progress, but our society has made equally noteworthy regressions. We have forgotten the real reason why Dr. King's speech changed hearts and minds, and we have slipped back into familiar habits. The habits about which I speak are deeply embedded in our culture and are a detriment to our black and brown brothers and sisters. These habits are so entrenched, in fact, that they are barely recognizable in their current form. They are the habits of religious passivity and racial apathy. In his letter from Birmingham jail, Dr. King writes a scathing critique against the passive members of the Christian clergy. To those Christians who encourage blacks to endure their public persecution in quiet fortitude, King writes, we will have to repent in this generation, this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Are we satisfied, I ask you today? Is justice rolling down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream? There are data which show that in America, the land of the free, the annual median income in white households was $57,000 $57,000 in the year 2012, while the annual median income in black households was $24,000 in that same year. Now, to put that in perspective for you, the annual median income in black households was 58% less than the annual median income in white households in the year 2012. Disparities between blacks and whites are not confined to the household, however. No, they permeate all sectors of our modern society. Today, in some states, black men are 20 to 50 times more likely to be arrested, convicted, and incarcerated, even though experts tend to agree that blacks and whites consume and deal drugs at about an equal rate. More pressingly, studies indicate that an alarming one in three black men will end up in prison at some point in their lifetime. Now, to put that in perspective for you, the new Jim Crow argues that the United States imprisons a larger percentage of its black population than did South Africa at the height of apartheid. Our nation's complete disregard for black and brown life is further evidenced in the way that grieving families have been consistently and unapologetically denied justice in cases of misuse of excessive force. I am almost certain that this audience has heard of Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and the late Walter Scott. And many of you may remember Rodney King, a black construction worker who was savagely beaten in 1991. Fewer of you probably remember Amadou Diallo, an unarmed West African immigrant who was shot 41 times in 1999. 
An even smaller portion of you will remember Sean Bell and Oscar Grant and Aaron Campbell and seven-year-old Diana Jones and Alonzo Ashley and Wendell Allen and Jonathan Farrell. The men and women whose names I invoke have a few things in common. They are all people of color, they were all unarmed, and they were all unjustly killed by members of the police force. Your acquaintance with the deceased, however, is not sufficient. Today, I charge you, you, with the task of renouncing your religious passivity and your racial apathy. I'll ask you again, are we satisfied today? Is justice rolling down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream? For today's purposes, I will posit that Christ was an activist and that Dr. King understood Christ as such. The Christ who was immortalized in the Christian Bible not only dined with sinners, he healed the sick, restored sight to the blind, and gave his very life for a cause greater than himself. The Christ who was immortalized in the Christian Bible spoke against the inhumane treatment of those who were considered part of the Jewish and Roman underclass and was himself part of a mistreated and marginalized subgroup. The Christ of the Bible was a carpenter by trade, humble by nature, and plain in appearance. Isaiah describes a man who had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, a man who was despised and rejected by mankind, and a man who was very familiar with pain. The Christ who was described in the Bible was considered an outsider because of his Jewishness and, paradoxically, because of his ideological uniqueness. That's right. Contrary to popular consensus, Christ was and is a deeply political figure. The Christ of the Bible upended and reversed the practice of primogeniture, the right of succession belonging to the firstborn that was common practice in feudal societies. In Matthew, he declares, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Again in Matthew, Christ lists the Beatitudes, effectively subverting the Roman political apparatus and claiming that neither political clout nor material wealth could secure one a place among the divine. In John, the Christ of the Bible grants amnesty to a woman who is sentenced to death, saying, he who is without sin cast first stone. And perhaps most extraordinarily, the Christ of the Bible does posthumously what many men in antiquity were too blinded by their misogyny to do. He empowers women. As documented in Mark, his resurrection is said to have been witnessed first by Mary Magdalene, a credit which would have been widely rejected in antiquity since women were not considered credible independent witnesses. You see, while the Christ of the Bible certainly came to fulfill the divine law, I would caution any Christian who would deny that Christ also came to undo unjust human laws. Therefore, let us not remember baby Christ, nor Christ transfigured on the mountaintop, nor even Christ crucified. Let us remember the Christ who lived to serve the poor, to alleviate the sufferings of the afflicted, and to defend the oppressed. Let us remember the Christ who with one of his last few breaths pardoned a condemned criminal. To close, I would like to remind you that both Christ and Dr. King were more than revolutionaries. They were visionaries. Both Christ and Dr. King stood and continue to stand as universal symbols of freedom. Freedom to resist, freedom to hope, and freedom to dream. In Christ's time, it meant dismantling structural oppression by encouraging repentance, devotion, and empathy. 
In King's time, it meant celebrating a liberated India, opposing the war in Vietnam, and advocating for the universal economic emancipation of impoverished peoples. In our time, it means realizing that environmental injustice, mass incarceration, housing discrimination, mental health stigma, homophobia, xenophobia, and anti-religious rhetoric are all interconnected issues which help to propagate the habits of religious passivity, racial apathy, and crushing oppression. For those of you who are crippled by racial apathy, I plead with you to recognize that these socio-political issues are equally deserving of your attention as their victims are numerous and often nameless. For those of you who believe in the authority of scripture and who suffer from religious passivity, I leave you with an exhortation found in Isaiah, which says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, and plead the case of the widow. From the crowd that we have here, I can see that some of you have begun to realize that your freedom is inextricably bound to black freedom, and that empathy is the only antidote to hatred. For those of you who have yet to awaken and who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? I say, we can never be satisfied. God bless. Thank you.